Boom. Got it. So, um, Howie Mandel, I'm going to do a lot of name dropping here, like a lot of name dropping. So get, here, we, here, here, here we go. Yeah. Put on your seatbelts, folks. Got a lot of picking up to do. Um, and by the way, this story was confirmed to me by Adam Carolla himself. There was a time when, 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 when Howie had a house in Malibu right across the street from Adam Carolla. Since then, they've both sold their respective homes, right? And Adam was having some kind of get together, a charity event. And John Popper was, was the music, right? But oh, well, then he would Adam, definitely know him. So that's another way I could get I could get to John Popper probably through Howie. All right. Yeah. So at any rate, Howie went over to support this charity event. And they, how, Adam was doing some, I guess, some backroom interviews with all the celebrities. So how we walked in and John, they said, you know, John Popper's in the next room and you can hear him warming up. You know, it was a little joke they were playing on Howie and um, you can hear the harmonica in the other room. They opened it up and it was the hedgehog himself. That was at the party. You know, Whoa. Who, you know who the hedgehog is. Right? Yeah, that's awesome. So that's what was going on. But then Howie was very excited to tell me that John Popper played a harmonica and then handed it to him as a gift. And I looked at Howie and I said, whoa, whoa, whoa hang on. How you who won't touch any human being's hand. Right. Took something that John Popper was slobbering on and breathing on and, and pushing air through in a concert he handed it to you and now you're holding it. And he looked at me and he said, you do realize I'm crazy, right? And that just settled the whole thing. <laughs> see, whenever, whenever you're crazy and you know you're crazy. You just say I'm crazy. You could just go, yeah, I won't touch anyone's hands. Yeah, I'm germaphobe. But you're holding something that John Popper blew snot into. And you're OK with that. And it he just said, yeah, it doesn't make sense. I, I can just, you know, it's like diplomatic immunity. I'm crazy. Ta-da. That's the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. I got to say, because Howie was on the first season of Free Radio and we got him his own headphones, you know, wrapped up in the, in yeah. the case, in the plastic that it comes in. Yeah. By the way, those are impossible to open. So we had to then get him his own fresh scissors. Right. So he could open the thing. And, and Howie's lovely. He was great. Oh, he's and, the best. Uh, he doesn't know me at all, except for the times that I've been with you. And I've shot a couple commercials with him, but he wouldn't like remember like, oh, yeah, you're that lady from the commercial. Like, you would, you, you would be shocked because he's one of those guys that remembers everything. Unlike oh, maybe. Me. Yeah. Maybe. I've, I've wound up working with him a few times and, and he's just awesome. But it was funny because uh, it was, again, the same thing. I was like, you present very normal. Yeah, no, he is very normal for... And, and that's what we're going to be talking about today is crazy things people do, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when, when you think of Howie, yeah, you know, he's got his, his things. He's got his OCDs, you know. Uh, he told me one time that he got out of the car so many times to check the door because he thought he was dreaming that he kept checking that the door was locked, that he walked up to the door and punched it so that his hand can be hurting when he got back in the car to know that he was actually at the door. Right. That's what, you know, it, it's a real thing. And he, you know, he talks about that and having those problems. And as he told me once, you know, if you have a broken leg, you go to a doctor, they put a cast on it and everyone goes, Oh, you poor thing, you broke your leg because you can, you can, you can, you can visualize what may have happened to this person to get this cast. But when you have a mental illness, you can't see it. Right. And up until very recently, it was stigmatized left, yeah. right and center. Right. So we deal with that all the time. And if, if you don't have that problem, you know, sometimes we, we dismiss, you know, you go, oh, 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 yeah, OK, no, you don't really have a problem. And, you know, talking to Dr. Silas last week on the Friday show, a lot of that came up. You know, uh, we talk about my good friend, the billionaire, Don Coddington, who for years, you know, we'd go, look, I famously tell the story when we went to to Chamonix to climb Mont Blanc, 
Don and I were climbing. Don, I had him in zone two shape like you wouldn't believe. He listened yeah. to everything I told him for like eight months. He was already in good shape. He never missed a workout. The guy was running, going up and down mountains, staying in zone two. When we got to Chamonix, the guy was in shape like you wouldn't believe. But he was morbidly obese. Hmm. And which doesn't seem to reconcile. Right. But, you know, it, when you have a problem, a food addiction, you can, you know, you, you've heard me say it a thousand times. You can't, you, you can't exercise away a bad diet. And Don was proof. I mean, towards the end, he was probably doing 60, 70 hours of aerobics a week leading up to Shomini because that's what I was doing. And we were on the same kind of plan. And when all that cardio, whoa, 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 I'm sorry, I said per week, I meant per month. Um, but I'm sorry. Okay. Per month, but he's doing, the point is he's doing all that cardio and he's right. still overweight. It's not like he's burning the fat away. He didn't lose a pound. It didn't lose one pound. And let, let me just keep going with the Don Coddington story because it matters here. And we, we, we climbed, we did a warm up glacier before and the warm up glacier, by the way, was 14,000 feet. It was like doing Whitney except on ice. So right. we went to Italy, we went to Grand Paradiso, we did that. It, it might have been 13, eight or something, but it was a, it was a, an altitude hike. It was on a glacier. You know, you had to have your crampons, you know, you had to have your ice picks, the whole deal. It was a real deal climb. You know, we were all roped in and Don did better than most of the fit people, you know, the people who looked fit. But the people, the, the people we hired to lead us up that mountain and Mont Blanc, same group, they saw Don as a fat guy. Right. An out of shape guy. They couldn't see how fit this guy was. Right. And we were actually on the mountain and sleeping in a hut the night before we, we did our ascent of Mont Blanc. And the head of the company came to me and he said, listen, we've already spoken to Don. We're going to talk to you. Have you seen Don yet? I went, no, he's around somewhere. I haven't seen him. And they said, well, we're not going to let you guys climb together tomorrow, which kind of broke my heart because the whole idea was that we were going to climb this together and, and I'm in bros. I'm not going to go against, you know, when you're on a mountain and you've paid someone, an expert to guide you up that mountain. Yeah. I'm not going to go, Hey, mother effer, I paid you, you my buddy. And I, you know, I, I'm not that guy. And Don isn't either. They said, we're going to put Don with this Italian climber and they're going to go off. They're going to start two hours earlier than everyone else. And we're putting you with this triathlete. And we've told the story of that, of how, you know, he was sick most of the time. Anyway, Don went up the mountain and came back down the mountain in the same amount of time that I went up the mountain. Now, I would have gone up a little quicker. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, we had to stop, keep stopping for the 34-year-old the triathlete, right, who was not in good enough shape. Don wow. was in better shape than a 34 year old triathlete and he was morbidly obese. Did the, did the people in charge at Chamonix, did they, did they acknowledge that? It, it was, um, no, oh, it was, it, it, we hired these people out of England. It was an English um, group, oh, okay. um, but no, they, they didn't, they, you know, they, they did kind of give Don an attaboy and good job and oh my God. But, Right. I don't think anybody except me would notice the times because I said, Don, I took off at this time and I finished at this time. What time did you finish? And it turns out he got up and down quicker than right. me. Who was hanging off of a rope with a triathlete. Yeah. You know? Right. Now, what does that tell you? The guy was in perfect shape, morbidly obese. And this continued on. And no matter... You know, we climbed together at Whitney. We, we spent time in Mammoth. You've heard all of the trips we take together, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when he was with me, he, you know, he would eat what, you know, we would eat big giant steaks and, you know, we'd make them right there in the camp and do all this stuff. But when my nephews would pull out the Swedish fish, guess who was joining in? Don Coddington. When, you know, right. Because he's addicted to 
sugars. He's addicted to carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. He would tell me, um, I didn't know what a devil dog, did you know what a devil dog was? <laughs> devil dogs are legendary in the Tarquinio family. I only ever had them once right before I was diagnosed with celiac because Leslie, Al's wife, Lauren's mother used to make them homemade and it took her days to make them. Now I know they're store-bought devil dogs, but she used to make these homemade devil dogs and they still talk about it and they still, the sons fight about it. Who gets when she makes them and she's old now and doesn't have the energy to make the devil dogs and they still argue about who gets to have the devil dog. So yes, I'm intimately familiar with that, but I haven't had one in at least 20 years. Okay, this summer when Cotty Cod and I were up in Mammoth doing our trek, he, I, I said, Don, you know, what would you get like on the way home from work? What, what would you get? You know, he went, nah, and I stop off and, and I, I get a box of devil dogs that they were done before I got home. Whoa. And you know, from the city to his house. And right. I was like, I said, Don, excuse my ignorance, but <laughs> what the, Devil dog? I thought he would make, uh, I thought he was talking maybe Intermans. You were, you were thinking, kind of, oh, I thought maybe you were thinking like a hot dog or something. I was, I was thinking something with meat in it. I was like, no, what no, no, no. That, like <laughs> no, the, the guys in New York, he goes, oh, now you're just making this up. You, you, you're pretending you don't know what a devil dog is. I'm like, I had never heard of one until maybe it's a Northeast thing. Cause I had North, never heard yes, of it. It's a Northeast thing. I had never heard of a devil dog. He goes, no, they're insane for devil dogs. They're all nuts for devil dogs. Yeah, and folks, if you don't know what it is, it's like a sandwich of two chocolate cakes with, with looks a like homemade cream, cream filling. filling. Yeah. yeah, well, if it's homemade, yeah, a cream filling. And uh, he goes, okay. A ding dong without the emulsified chocolate around. That's it. what he started asking me. He goes, you know what a ding dong is? Of course I know what a ding dong is. Do you know what a low W is? Yeah, absolutely. I knew what, a, uh, I knew what all of that was. I had never heard of a devil dog. And... I said, so you would just eat devil dogs? He goes, no, it could be anything. I, I would eat, he, he, he would tell me if he bought like the whole thing of Oreos, that was a serving, right? That's how you stay morbidly obese when you're doing 70 hours of aerobics per month. Think about folks, break that down per week. You're doing, he was doing as much as a Tour de France rider does when they're training. Think about that. That's crazy. By the way, I just Googled right. devil, devil dogs. They yeah, don't look I, very good. The no, homemade ones that Leslie made definitely look better than that. Went to Coddington, they're delectable. So at some point, he just decided to address his addiction to, to sweets. Mm -hmm. And he treats it exactly like an addiction. Right. Right. Um, like you would AA or anything else. He he just abstains completely. And he's been able to do that, I want to say for two years now. It started before the pandemic. And he started losing weight. As a matter of fact, during the pandemic, Serena and I had to drive up to New York. And um, we were meeting Coddington at a hotel to go eat some, some dinner. And when he walked in, of course, he had the face mask on. I said, oh, that, that's Coddington. And Serena did a double take. And she was like, that's not, that's not Coddington. I said, like, oh, no, that's Coddington. And the first thing she walked up to him and said, you look. Wait, Serena's actually in the room stretching. I mean, what did you say to Connington when you saw him? And I said, do me. Yeah, she said, do me. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, she, he was looking hot. And he was like, I guess I had, I guess I have to watch now. It's like, uh, yeah, it's like, do I, I this is odd. I mean, I feel uncomfortable. Should I leave? Should Do I, you know, is this like a cuck holding thing? What, what are we I doing? Guess, I guess so. You know, I got cucked that night by my best friend. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was a little strange, but but it, he looks uh, good. And, and by the way, between that and the next time I saw Connington, which was in um, Whitney this summer when he came with me because we were sponsoring Bad Water with right. our ultra fat products and the whole thing. Um, or you yeah. hiked it twice behind your back. Yeah, yeah. He went back the He's next. He's doing all kind of things behind your back. Folks, listen to this. This is a guy who we, we went up Whitney, then we went to the event that my company was sponsoring, NSNG Foods. We went back to Whitney, we couldn't summit because there was a lightning storm the, the second time we were trying to do it. So we went about halfway up the second time, something like that, and then came back down again. He couldn't get it out of his brain. He flew back the next week and I don't want to exaggerate, maybe summon it once or twice more. 
he's just he running up. Twice more, I remember. Yeah, he's just running up and down that mountain now, but he looks like a different nut job, nut job. Yeah, but you see, it's like he's been relieved of the 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 shell, right? Yeah. It's off of him, you know, the ankle weights are off, you know, he he is like he broke out of this, this fat suit he was in, he still has all the fitness in the world, he works out the way I work out, he looks like a different human being. And the only thing he has to do to continue what he's doing is to, to fight his addiction off. Just and don't eat devil dogs. Don't eat devil dogs. Don't. And it's not just devil dog. It's everything. Yeah. It, as a matter of fact, when I'm with Coddington now, I don't have my, my scotch or anything because he's not having a drink. Yeah. He, he's not drink. you know, like, and it's, it's weird to go, Hey man, I'm going to have a scotch. Tonight. You, no, he's not going to have one. So I'm not going to have one. Besides we're out there doing healthy stuff. Who right. wants to have a scotch, you know, it, it's, it's that sort of thing. And, you know, you, you got to respect that. And then you and I started realizing he's not the only one because I'm gonna let you talk now. You you see it a lot in the Facebook groups, you, you see it on your, your clubhouse on Mondays. People get into this whole all or nothing attitude, right? Or am I saying that wrong? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's interesting the patterns now having done this with you for 10 years of seeing P and been, been through it myself, the patterns of people getting very um, black and white and binary with their thinking. So, uh, I, which, you know, I'm not arguing. Yes, it's definitely, hold on, I'm trying to, are my levels okay? Do I sound okay? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, you, you, okay. you're good. Yeah. I'm my levels of my own headphones here. Yeah. <clears throat> So the cutting out the processed sugars and grains sometimes then transposes into like they're, they're bringing the diet mentality with them into NSNG, right? And then right. it becomes, I'm going to be diet mentality in NSNG. <clears throat> and I see posts like one late, this is several months ago, a lady wrote, I ate, I ate spaghetti squash. I know I've been bad. And she did like a sad face emoji. And I was like, wait, what happened? You ate spaghetti or spaghetti squash? And just the language surrounding being bad or being good. Right, you know what right. I'm saying? Is like something that early on, what drew me to your work and wanting to get on board with this is that we're not going to label things bad or good. It's like cut out sugars and grains. But then if you eat the sugars and grains, the next minute, get right back on cutting out sugars and grains. You don't need to count. You need to eat real food, but if then if you do, which you will, because everybody does, because they're human, you know what I mean? Like it was a lot of right, like, right. The, well, let's let's peel back the layers of the onion of what we have to believe, because I think, and this is my take on being in the groups often, because I want to show my support, but also be active and give people support, and being on the clubhouses, is that people are still white knuckling through NSNG. And then they transpose that diet mentality onto actual food. Right. And, and by the you know way, it, it, can, it can become, a, it becomes its own eating disorder. Right. Yes. Um, you know, and look, I get it when people say, Hey, an apple is sugar. Just like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're right. It is. You're right. Um, and if you can't handle an apple, I get it. If you're that addicted to sugar, you can't have an apple, but guess what? Some people can. That's why I always tell people, this is not cut and dry. They'll, they'll always go, what's the diet? What's the diet? But everybody what wants to know, what can, give me know. the list of permissible foods and the list of impermissible foods. Right. And and, the and, only and, list of, and it's not even impermissible. It's like, avoid sugars and grains. Folks, we all live, <laughs> we all live in the world and society we don't live in a lab. If you think you're going to get away with a lab mentality, look, kudos to people who can do who can do um, carnivore and just eat meat right. and eggs. Kudos sure. to you. But guess what? For a lot of people, and, and by the way, Coddington is one of those people, he figured out if I just eat this, I feel good all the time. I'm fine. Right. Here's the problem. Most people will turn that into a fucking eating disorder. That's right. 
they go from zero to eating disorder in 2.5 seconds. Right. You, you and, know, and it, generally, it just, they just do. And, and that's, that's not good. It's just not a good thing to do. Well, a lot of it is that just because you change the way that you eat doesn't mean you've changed your behavior. And I think that's where it gets confusing. It's like the difference <laughs> between uh, somebody going through recovery, right? As opposed to being right. a dry drunk. We know that we know, you know what I mean? There's a distinction. The dry drunk, yes, they're not drinking alcohol, but have they gone through any motions to repair, amend, all the, you know, the steps? And the whether steps. you agree with the 12 steps, there, there is a distinction. Look, uh, I'm pretty I, sure. I actually know people who have quit drinking and quit doing drugs, and they're still the biggest asshole on the planet. You're like, whoa, Wait, okay, the, I don't oh, want to be around you. <laughs> hang on, even 12 steppers, they will tell you, just because you're 12 stepping and you're doing it to the T, it doesn't stop you. It doesn't cure you from being an asshole. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly so, it. And I'm not trying to call people. Hey, listen, if you've quit drinking or you've quit eating sugars and grains, you're not being an asshole. I'm saying this, re relate this to being an asshole to yourself because, and maybe an asshole to others if you're being the food police. But I, I think that the, the broader question to ask is number one, are you eating? Let's, let's use the apple. That's a great example. Okay. An apple, something that's been completely painted as a benign food. In fact, it, the phrase is an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but we know there's sugar in that apple. So for the most part, I know about you and I know about me, we don't eat apples. Right. right. Um, every now and then I'll use one in a recipe, but maybe let's say four times a year I have an apple or actually I would split it with Lauren and have a half an apple. And that's even like between all the times I would use it in a recipe, like a pork chop recipe or something like that. Yeah. So I'm, I, but an apple on its own, I would never have that. No, never, ever. I would have it with some, something, the cheese or the whatever. And, but I think to myself, am I eating an apple every single day at a certain time? Do I need to have whatever that food is? Do I need to have it? Is there something with the crunch? Is there something with the sweet? Is there something that I'm denying? And I'm going, you know, you, you need to look at like what your motivators are behind having the food. And if it's to fill a craving or have a crunch or do a thing, then there's something going on emotionally, just full stop. There's something else going yeah. on. Yeah. You're having the apple and you're like, huh, I had the apple. And then you notice, hey, I didn't beat myself up for having an apple. I'm going to move on with my life. And then you don't have another apple for several, a long period of time. Then you know. But just because somebody eats an apple or if you eat an apple, it doesn't make you a bad person. I would just look and see like it's an apple. It's real food. The, we didn't get fat from e overeating apples. Would you agree with that statement? I, I, I agree a thousand percent. Um, you know, I, look. As I tell people, you can be in SNG without being in deep dietary ketosis. You know, you can just, you become metabolically flexible. Once you do the work and you lose the weight, you can, you can mess around with it. You know, so I'm, I'm always in ketosis because of my cancer. <clears throat> and um, Serena has this thing, you know, we, we eat fairly European-like, where the cheese comes out after dinner probably once or twice a week, or if guests are over more times per week. It's how you just keep hanging around the table, right? And Serena will do a thing not every time. But every now and then she buys it. But, you know, I never buy this stuff. She'll buy a couple of pears or an apple or two. Mm -hmm. Usually, what it's, I'm talking about. usually it's a pear in season. And what she'll do is she'll put the pear on on the cheese board. Right. And she'll cut a sliver. I, and I'm talking about a microscopic sliver. And she'll put it on with the cheese and she'll eat it like that. It's like this little sweet and kind of salty at the same time. But, but what if it wasn't a microscopic sliver? What if it was just a sliver? What if it was just a slice? What would happen? It's, well, let, let me clear that up. Hers is more of a slice. Mine is a microscopic sliver. And you'll go, wait a minute, you I'm eat I'm just fruit? saying, like, because then and, it's and like, the, oh, if I, if I can have a microscopic piece, you're, you're basically right, telling right. people to get cut a tiny... No, it's bite. just, actually, my cutting of the pear has more to do with my control of the knife. I'm proud of my cut. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm just going to be I honest. Know, I know you. I know you. You know, because I used to skin out. Mm -hmm. I don't do it much. Anymore. Skin animals, you got to be able to skin. And I'm very good with the knife and, and the whole thing. And I'm, I'm just, I don't say to Serena, look at this. Look at this cut. Look at, you know, I'm just doing it. And boy. You're just satisfied with a job well done. I just did with that perfect knife. And I'll do it. And, I'll, and people are, wait a minute. You, you, you're having pear? Guess what? Not enough to knock me out of ketosis. Not even close. And if I do that six or seven times with pear, with the cheese and everything else, after I just had a fattening meal, it's not going to do anything. It's right, like right. throwing a tissue in, in the fireplace. It's going to go and just puff away, right? It's not enough to cause a problem. It's not going to knock me out of ketosis. And guess what? It tasted good when you mix that with the cheese. Oh, it's with the we had a, our pear tree went crazy this year. And I probably ate the total of two pears during the pear season. And then I made a bunch of things and then I gave them away, gave away the pears. So Anna, let's do wait, and, Let's talk about, wait, let's talk about your pear and let's talk about my pear. So people I would split might, it with Lauren and have cheese with it always. But folks might hear, wait a minute. Vinny says every time I have cheese, I can have pear. That's what he does after all. I didn't say that, but that's when people are addicted, they'll hear, oh, you know what? Anna has two pairs every week. She just said, <laughs> every day. You know, no, it's interesting because Lauren hear, kept saying we need to eat these pears, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing pears right now." And I'll, I'll split one with you, and you know, over the and and it's like a, it's all an individual decision. But what if I had eaten a pear a day during pear season? Let's say for those two weeks, what would happen? I'd be out of ketosis, and then I'd have to get back in ketosis. Would I become morbidly obese from having a pear every day? No. No, no. But also, too, I also feel like it's kind of part of the journey because you have to know yourself. And if you're getting super restrictive on NSNG and you're judging things that are maybe on the like, well, eat it if it works for you or don't eat it if it doesn't work for you. You know what I mean? Then there's still an issue there. And we're, by the way, none of us are like completely issue free. Everybody has to come, has to work through this all the time. Right. Can I give the example of, and then who's listening, the person who's listening is going to recognize themselves in this post. I'm not going to call out her name because I love her so much. And it's oh, not I'm a call out. To call her name out. No, I love her so much. But it was, um, I can't remember whether it was in my group or in the main group. It, the idea of the post, the, the, the gist of it was, you know, I never have fruit. And then I had a handful of blueberries and my blood sugar spiked to 105. So guess who's never having fruit again? And then like sad face emoji. And I see you're shaking your head right now for the people who are watching. Yeah, just, yeah. Uh, yeah. Listening. And, and the thing is, and then everyone's like, it's okay. Just get back on the train. You don't, don't beat yourself up. Just don't do it again. And I was like, well, hold on. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold, stop. Stop the presses. Yeah. 105 is a very natural range for a postprandial response of your blood sugar. That's what it's supposed to do. It, your, your blood sugar is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. Don't beat yourself up for your body working. Number one. You see, everyone gets it. Like I said, we live in a real world. We don't live in a lab. You can't look at metrics like that. And, you know, look, I, I, I do it as perfectly as you could do it. And I'm not perfect. You're but I'm saying kidding. if it went up to like 180 or, or some or 130, that was, even, that would be a spike. I would be like, yeah, that's a spike. But 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 I was like, but the fact then that everyone's going, it's OK. Don't and be Anna, if you remember, but I was like, yeah. stop the madness. Well, look, People say to me all the time, um, hey, you know, you used to talk about blueberries. And, you know, you put them in your fat shake and, you know, and now, you know, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I never said I stopped using blueberries when. When did I ever stop using berries at all? Right. Berries are, I'm always telling people, NSNG, if you want to have fruit, have berries. Blueberries, right. blackberries, raspberries, strawberries. Oh, Vinny, if you saw in the group how much berries have been completely demonized and maligned, you would be like, whoa. I, I know. And people go, on, folks. But, but you see, they think I was the one that, that handed that down. I'm still living in the same world. I can't stop with, even in my own group, I can't stop what people are going to do. Right. No, I know that. But so I, I guess you and I wanted to have this so that like, it's more of be aware in yourself 
Yeah. And we're never going to, we're never going to not have an influx of new people asking the same questions. Cause I was that person when I was writing you about parsnips and you were oh, like, yeah. I don't know, eat the parsnips. How do you feel? And I was like, fine. Are you in ketosis? Yeah. And I mean, I know not everybody has a goal of being in ketosis. Right. And now I'm so naturally in it that I can have sushi rice, for example, and I don't, by the next day I'm back in and I don't do that. I maybe once a year have sushi, <clears throat> but that was one of the things that I did with my uh, continuous glucose monitor. Cause I was curious about that. And there were two, two experiments that I did. One of them was the white rice, which you and I had talked about white right. rice is even better. And the spike was like to one sixteen. Like it was, again, it was very much so, but it was still, I know me and I, white rice is not something I'm going to add back into my diet. I'm not going to add that in on the regs, even though my body is, at least for that one experiment, had a fine response. But then I had those kettle potato chips, mm. not too many of them. The crunch, the crunchy thing that I probably miss the most. I love, I love uh, potato chips or corn chips, you know? You know, there are things called, pork rinds but go on i know i don't like pork rinds i like them crushed up and used in things no i for the most part i don't i don't stress i don't stress about the chewy the bitey crunchy thing anymore the salty fatty crunchy thing anymore i'm over that but lauren had some potato chips and i was like "Ooh, this is an excuse to do an experiment right and i enjoyed having some potato chips a half a cup of potato chips maybe like 15 potato chips yeah. And the blood sugar went to 137. And I found that interesting because of the fried carb aspect. Well, uh, you know, you know I mean? and no, I was like, well, no, that's Anna, interesting. It's actually a potato versus rice. You've, you've probably potato remember me saying okay. at some point that out of all the, the carbohydrates, now people are going to take this the wrong way. The one that gives you the least spike is white rice. Right. It's just what it is. You know, for most people, white rice won't cause the damage of bread or pasta or pota potatoes. And bread and pasta, I'm not going to eat because I don't eat those things because of celiac. Right. So, yeah. And so, <clears throat> so my I don't know. I've seen, I was reading a blood a blood sugar thing about uh, an uh, not an article. It was an article that led to the study, and I actually read the study, and it was interesting about blood sugar spikes with f basically fried carbs are the worst, like donuts, potato chips. Yeah, that, you get, don't get me wrong, the other stuff is bad, but then the fried stuff takes it to a whole other level. So if you have an issue with blood sugar stuff, and I was like, yeah, you know what? It was interesting for me to see that and go, yeah, you know what? That's one reason I don't feel good after I eat potato chips. Probably also the seed oils, probably also the, all the things. It's like it's like a shit, shit sandwich <laughs> wrapped into a snack that doesn't work for me. No, I couldn't imagine. But am I upset that I ate? I'm actually glad I ate it and did the experiment. I'm glad I saw it. Right. You know, but um, also too, if somebody writes like, oh, I had potato chips, I go, okay, you know what? Now, you know. Yeah. Just leave them alone. Leave them alone. Potato chips, French fries, man. These things are, you know, you, you want to talk about bad for your body, bad for your health. You know what, Vin? Nothing worse. Don't so I think that that crunchy, salty thing can sometimes be assigned to nuts and people go crazy with the nuts. And I will say nuts are not, again, nuts are not inherently bad. We did not get fat from overeating nuts. Right. We didn't. We just didn't. I'm sorry. We didn't get fat from eating parsnips. We didn't get fat from eating apples or pears blueberries or nuts those things were around back when we were all lean and but but you can tell ask yourself when you sit there or if you buy some nuts do you eat them like a hog on the trough are you like oh my god i can't stop your body's sending you satiety signals and you're like pounding those nuts then you know something's going on and you need to ask like, hey what is going on what am i actually feeding here what do I need that crunch for? And listen, when I needed the crunch, it was definitely, and we've talked about this before, about the Lay's company doing the studies back in the 60s and 70s. Sure, the potato sure. chip company Lay's did a study of the perfect bite point because as humans, when we get ornery, frustrated, we feel aggressive, we grind our teeth. That's how we 
like think of like gorillas showing their power, right? They grind right, their right, teeth right, right, right. or like do bro dudes who are like about to get in a fight. They're like, Ooh, you know what I mean? They do that. Well, guess what? Everybody does that when they feel that you clench your jaw, you grind your teeth. And one of the ways of releasing that tension is to chomp on something. And usually in the afternoon, when some people choose a sweet snack, because they have that fading thing and just right. got to get through the day. So I'm going to have my sweet snack. Other people like to chew. That's why you hear the people go, oh, I like the salty, crunchy snacks. Generally, the Lay's people capitalize on this. There's, there's unresolved anger, frustration, orneriness coming through, whatever you, whatever you want to call it to whatever degree. And so you crunch on the oh, potato chips. And so the Lay's company figured out the exact crunch point where, quote, no one can each as one. And people become addicted to it in that, in that way. I've got to have my crunch. I've got to have my afternoon snack. They're literally taking human nature, which is, you know, in the late afternoon in the day, y'all are getting upset. You're getting frustrated. Well, here's a thing that's going to help you. No one can eat just one. Here's your potato chips. And we don't know that. We just think, I just like crunchy, salty things. So then you move over to NSNG, right? And right. then you get, you get the bag of nuts. You're like about three, four o'clock. You're just popping those nuts and eating those nuts. And then you think I can't be trusted around nuts. That's the, the thing that you think I cannot be trusted. So I'm going to cut out all the nuts. I'm never going to have it. Not even one nut. I'm not going to sprinkle it on a thing. I'm not even going to have nuts. And when really the issue is, and then you try to white knuckle it through what's going on emotionally with yourself. Am I making sense here, Vin? You are, but you know, I, I, I hearken back to the phone calls, you know, I, I because that's where I'm in touch. That, that's boots on the ground for me. Yeah. And usually when I see someone who, you know, they still have weight to lose and their, their weight loss has slowed down or maybe even stopped, in some cases started going in the wrong direction, what they'll do is... <clears throat> And I haven't told I, I haven't given this analogy in a long time, but I'll give it today on this podcast because it, it matters here. Um, you know, they'll say, well, you know, you said nuts were OK. And, um, you know, I have some pistachio nuts and I have some some, you know, uh, cashews and whole thing. And I'll say, well, you know, what about walnuts? What about pecans? What about macadamia? Yeah, I used to do those, but I like these better. Well, yeah, because they're more carby. And then they'll well, also they'll, too, those are the ones that come flavored usually or, or roasted or, you know, they don't want to eat raw nuts. Most of them play, will tell me that they're eating them just salted. But, but OK, all right. And then they'll say, well, you, you know, you said we can have berries. So, you know, I have a lot of berries and every night I make like a, you know, your berry ice cream and this and that and the whole thing where you just put berry and creams and just whip it up and the whole thing. And then they'll start saying things that I've never said. You know, um, you know, I'll put a little honey on my yogurt. <laughs> yeah. well, where did that come from? Well, you know, it's paleo. That's kind of like an SNG. You know, I'll start hearing these things where they started off innocently going, well, I'm losing weight. Let me see what I can put back in until they start putting enough stuff back in to where they stall. And then they're going, I don't understand. You know, they're on the phone. But this with is me. what I'm saying. If you're eating an entire bag of pistachios yeah. or let's say a half a bag of pistachios and the next night, the second half of the bag of pistachios, that's where the food addiction comes in. Because it's not the problem with the pistachios. There's something underneath that and you have to take a look at it or else you're then you're going to re replace pistachios with something else. You're going to find something else to overeat. And then th then you hear about the people who are like, well, I'm 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 I'm, you know, I've restricted everything. And then I just, oh, oh, I overeat this one thing. And it's like, I know because you're not figuring out what the root of the problem is because you should be able to have five bags of nuts in your pantry and you eat them reasonably. But you're talking about addiction. I know that's what I'm saying. And, and let me give another example. I have this recipe called the pumpkin bars, right? Right. And the, and the pumpkin bars are a sweet treat designed to be a sweet treat. And somebody posted in the group, well, she actually messaged me first and I asked her to post in the group because it actually is more helpful if people post, instead of messaging me sure. directly, sure. please post it in the group. It also saves me some time. And she, and I actually told her to do this and then nobody answered her. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. 
So she wanted to double the pumpkin bars recipe or should she double it? Cause she had a bigger pan. I don't know what, how, how long should the cook time be? And I said to her, I've never doubled it, but if I were to, uh, I would just cook it for, you know, 70, you know, d- double the time and cook it for 75% of that. And then check it every 10 minutes after that. It's not, it's yeah. a simple recipe. Right. And, um, but it is a sweet treat and it doesn't cross my mind to say like, Hey, why are you doubling the recipe? Are you sure you should be doing that? Like, I don't care. She's that's that's not your job. Not my job to police everybody. But then I noticed the post coming in of, I could never double the recipe. Then I'd eat the whole thing. Oh, I, I can't make those. They're too dangerous. And I get that. And it's like what you're talking about, about being aware of what your food addiction is. And here's something that happened to me that I hope happens for everybody. And I was really up. Okay. So two weeks ago for the Instagram live or the Facebook live or YouTube live. Oh, YouTube live. I made the pumpkin bars. I haven't made them in years, but I made the pumpkin bars. Right. And they're delicious. And for like the first hour after they're made, we're like, oh yeah, that's so yummy. That's so yummy. Then like later they, oh, I eat a little bit more. And then the next day I have a bite and then the, I'm done. And we threw out, it's an eight by eight pan. We threw out, you know, half and then a little thing. Like it, we threw it out on day three. And to me, that feeling of I ate what I wanted, I got over it, I didn't overeat it, it wasn't the boss of me, I wasn't obsessing over it being in the other room, and I threw it out because I didn't have that feeling of, I don't know what I'm going to get, I haven't made this in four years, and so I better eat all of it now because I'm probably not going to make it for another four years like yeah. that feeling, I, it was just like, I ate what I wanted and then I threw it out and it felt light and it felt like I wasn't <clears throat> a prisoner to a baked good. Right. And if you feel like you're obsessed with or a prisoner to a baked good, I understand the feeling of, I can't even make that or I'm going to eat the whole thing. But then I go, okay, great. Now, what is that? peel that back and figure out what that is. Right. Why do you need to have that thing? That's where the real healing is going to happen. That's all I'm saying. No, listen, we're, we're getting ready. You know, we're making plans. You know, we're going to be in, in, in Europe for uh, Christmas and we're staying with Kristen and her boyfriend. <clears throat> I've never met this guy. And, um, it's like, shit, there's going to be all this Christmas fair around and people are going to send stuff over. And, you know, what, what do you say yes to and what do you skirt yourself away from? Or, you know, how do you go hide? And, um, oh, my God, you know, do I just go on all day hikes out in the countryside? It's going to be freezing and wet and cold. And what do I do to stay away from being around this? Because I could be around it. No problem. Right. But when people are going, hey, I made this special and I want you to try it. Right. And you're at your sister-in-law's house. It's like, what, what, what do you do? And yeah. I've, I've never met the boyfriend and he's kind of a big deal. And I'm like, oh boy, you know, I'm sure he may pour his favorite scotch. In but yesterday we were talking to Kristen. I happened to walk in the room and <clears throat> we were in all spe- we we're all on speakerphone together and she was like, oh, yeah, John is, is into working out. I'm sure he's going to have a lot of workout. Going. He's full gym in the house, you know, and, and I'm sitting there going, thank God. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I can move the group in that direction a little bit. Right, right, not, right, right. You see, I can fake, oh, yeah, oh, thanks. Oh, the tart was delicious. But then there's five other things there, you know, and that would throw me out of ketosis. And I know exactly where my ketone line is. Right. I also know right where that line is for my brain to get excited, you know, because addiction is addiction. I feel like I have that addiction too. You know, all those years of squirting those gels in my mouth on the bicycle. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes I wonder if I rode the bicycle just to go get high on sugar. So, <laughs> well, in the holidays too, you feel like you once you open the floodgates, then you're on the sweet salty spiral. Right. You know what I'm saying? You're right. like, I got to have the sweet. Now I got to have the salty to counteract the sweet. Now I got to have the sweet. Now I got to have the salty. 
You're right. And we're going to be and then you just overeat in house. general. You know, and, and I'm invited on to a shoot and all this kind of stuff. And there's, you know, there's going to be so much navigation to do. But I, you know, I just have to get my brain straight before I go and just know when to go. Oh, thank you. But I'm okay. And oh, my God, it looks delicious. Let me try it and grab a small enough piece. And then when no one's looking, get rid of it. <laughs> because there's going to be a lot of that, right? And um, I remember the story, and I tell this story to people on the phone calls all the time. <clears throat> I don't know how accurate the story is. I've heard different iterations of it. And I haven't told it on the podcast probably in eight or 10 years. But I'll tell it right now. Uh, the great Jimi Hendrix, some uh, say, and I would agree, the best guitarist of all times. Uh, no, no one's been able to to capture what Jimmy was able to do um, with a guitar. And uh, for a black man who was playing in a blues band and he wanted to become a rocker, he realized that black guys couldn't become rockers in the United States at that time. So he did the only thing he could do. He went to hone his skills over in, in England. And he's playing around England and he's well known. And, and um, well, one night he goes into this club and he, He's watching Eric Clapton just rip it up, right? And then he's backstage and he's looking and he goes, you know, Eric, I notice um, you use uh, you, you use those uh, Fender amps. And uh, he goes, you know, I use Fender. And uh, he goes, but, you know, I've been thinking about using Marshall and the whole thing, but I noticed you have a, he goes, yeah, I use that Fender. Look at the stack. I use this stack and that stack. And you put those together, man, and it gives me that sound that I want, Right. A couple of nights later, he's in the same club, uh, Jimi Hendrix is, and he sees Jimmy Page on stage, another great guitarist, and he, he's backstage after the show. Oh, my God, great show. I noticed you have a stack of Marshalls. And he goes, oh, my God, Marshalls. I, I used them. I used that stack of Marshalls in just that configuration because, man, it just, it fucking blows everything away. And, and, and Jimmy's listening to this. Well, as the story goes, a couple of nights later, both Jimmy Page and Eric Clapton are sitting in the audience and Jimi Hendrix is up on stage. Jimmy has a stack of Fenders and a stack of Marshalls. <laughs> now, what made Jimi Hendrix great is also what killed Jimi Hendrix when he was 27. Right. So think about that, folks. If you're putting a stack of marshals on top of a stack of fenders, you might want to look at what else you're doing in your life. Because your life may not be exactly, <clears throat> I feel like Bill Maher right now, just kind of telling a little story at the end of the show here, but New does rule. that make sense? The Vinnie Tortorich. <clears throat> you know, Vinnie look, rules. yeah, the Vinnie rules. We, we should do those every week. Yeah. Yeah, that'll never happen again. But <laughs> But think about that, you know, uh, you know, all the people that, you know, the 27, you know, I, I think uh, my favorite Janis Joplin was uh, one of the in the 20s yeah, in that group. Uh, also, Steve, uh, Stevie, uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan, although he cleaned up from drugs and then hopped on a helicopter and lost his life. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, the, the thing that made the Pearl the greatest is what killed her. She died of an accidental heroin overdose. Yep. You know, also uh, the Doors guy. What, what was his name? Mojo Ryan. Oh. Right. Val Kilmer guy. <laughs> I never liked him. His name was uh, Jimmy. Something. Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison. Um, all of them, the thing that made them great is what killed them. Yeah. You know, think about that. Think about your addiction. You, know, you might need help. You know, you can always call me. Uh, I know Tro Collasian's out there. I just had Tro and, and uh, his beautiful wife, Rosette, on the show last night. Their show is going to come up after the show on a Friday. Great. And, you know, Tro was talking about how you try to bridge the gap with these people. He's got a four-month waiting list. Four months. That's amazing. You know, and it's, he, he's looking for doctors to come in and, and nurse practitioners to help him. Right. I mean, people are sick. That's a great opportunity. They, they want, yeah, they, they want to be better. 
right? Yeah. And you know, you, you look at that and you go, how, how do we do this? How, how do we make it better? How do we make all of this better? You know, and I and I understand, I understand, keep it out of the house. If you can't trust yourself, I totally get that. I'm not trying to say, don't do that, know thyself. But then the work's not over. Yeah. And you don't you don't hammer someone else who's eating blueberries, you know, everybody's on their own journey. You know, it took Coddington until Coddington was ready to do it. Yeah, right. And, and, and you're not gonna you're not gonna start. Um, I had a, a friend who I was pretty certain was going to die of alcoholism. Mm -hmm. I was almost positive of it. Yeah, that's scary. And one day, um, one night at two o'clock in the morning, while he was out drinking, he uh, drove himself to the hospital and uh, went to the emergency room and said, I want to stop drinking. And they kind of said, what are you doing here? And they and he said, Well, don't you guys help? He's like, Well, are you admitting yourself? And he goes, whatever it takes, I need he goes, I'm gonna stop drinking, I'm gonna kill myself. I'm, I'm, I'm killing myself. So yeah. the hospital medically dried him out for like a day or two. Wow. And then they said, okay, you you are no longer poisoned by alcohol. So we have to release you. And mm -hmm. this is where and I don't, I'm, I'm not religious, as you know, I'm an atheist, but this is where divine intervention comes in sometimes. The nurse that was checking him out, he said to the nurse, What do I do now? Where do I go? What do I do? And she pulled out a piece of paper and she scratched something on the piece of paper and folded it and handed it to him. And she said, go here. And she looked at her watch and she goes, they're starting a meeting at noontime. And mm -hmm. he's like, what kind of meeting? And she said, AA. And when someone came to pick the guy up, he said, drive to this address. And he goes, I'm sorry, but you're gonna to have to wait. And he goes, How long are you gonna to have to wait? And he goes, I don't know how long an AA meeting is, but you have to wait. And he's been sober now for 15 years. Oh, that's great. You know, and I can't tell you how many friends I have like that. You know, I've been lucky not to have those kind of addictions. I, I had a friend, Danny. Danny died two years ago. We didn't even know he had a problem. Those are drinking problems, folks. And if you think if you think eating problems are any different, you are you are dead wrong. You know, you got to get it under control. But you can't proselytize and tell someone else what to do. It never works. Right. And also what might be your demons are not somebody else's demons. But if they are your demons, get in there because it feels so good to come out the other side of it. There is an addiction that I do agree <clears throat> with. Oh boy, here we go. No, th there's one addiction. Mm -hmm. Olive oil. I uh -huh. mean, you, you want to be addicted to that stuff. It, it's actually, I think God himself, if he exists, would say, be addicted to olive oil. Yeah. And God, if you say, well, God, which one he would say, you know, well, you got to go to Puya. And you would, sure. yeah, there's a few the epicenter. There's some of it in there's a lot of it. Which one do you go to in Puglia? He would say, Easy. go to Capelli. Terlizzi. Go to Terlizzi. Go to find, Terlizzi. find a little a little estate called Villa Capelli. <clears throat> <clears throat> I was just messaging with Stephen this morning. He's gonna do some gift baskets. I don't know what they are yet. Nice. But um for the holidays. But here's the thing, guys. I know we should all start our holiday shopping early, but you should also get your olive oil early because if the holiday stuff sells out so that you don't get it, that's not okay. Put your mask on yourself and then take care of those around you. Get your olive oil for yourself and then take care of those around you. You're gonna need that olive oil to get through the holidays. I'd rather shoot olive oil than shoot alcohol. I'll be honest with yeah. you. Oh, and look, I've done it on this show. Anna, we have to do it on, with the video. You do shots again, yeah. I don't think people believe that we actually do it. Yeah, we, have, so we, do. we we need to start just like I bring my coffee in every time we got to start bringing yes. in Villa Capelli shots. And just do what it. if I whipped some Villa Capelli into my athletic blend? No, that Why would not? not work. 
God yeah. never intended. I'm doing a lot of God talk today. God never intended. You're, you're a Jesus freak all of a sudden. His two favorite things, olive oil and coffee. God looked at him and said, these are two perfect things. <laughs> Don't mix them. <laughs> Do not mix them. Don't become Jimi Hendrix. Oh, okay. Don't have a stack of athletic blend and then a stack of Villa Capelli. That's the, that's my, on my stage. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Villa Capelli is the best olive oil on the planet. Get your hands on some. Use the discount code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E. You'll get 10% off your order every single time. Vinny and I always say, get that order up and use, get the salts, get the flavored oil. Every product they have there is amazing. But get your product, your order up enough so that when you get the 10% off, you still get the free shipping. Do that. It's amazing. They're longtime sponsors of the show and, and we love them. And um, it, it's legit the best olive oil on the planet. So get some. And uh, while you're at it, go to Pure Coffee Club and sign up and trust me, trust and believe. People write me because because now I'm super into the athletic blend. And then they write me, they're like, I don't know, is it too much caffeine? And I was like, no, it's amazing. It's the perfect amount of You caffeine. will feel awesome. <laughs> trust me. I made that coffee taste just like my favorite uh, community coffee down yeah, there. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah. And, and I felt, and I, cause I felt the same. Th I, cause I, listen, you know how I feel about double French. It's my all time favorite coffee. Yeah. And I uh, was like, well, what happens if I get to, you don't get jittery. You don't. Nope. It's Not when you do it right. I don't know no. what you did. What sort of sorcery is in the athletic blend, but I, I love it. I, I, didn't, I didn't do any trickery. I just found, I mixed something that everyone told me in the coffee business not to do. I mixed very high end Robusta, which, you know, Robusta is considered, oh, cheap shit beans. Remember, but there's, there's high end Robustas and no one oh. likes to go there. I mixed that with some of my favorite Arabica beans and came up with a roast. They, they're roasted separately before we put them together. And, uh, okay. them up. and um, what happens is I was able to mimic the coffee that that Louisiana taste that that uh, community coffee taste. That's why everyone says to me, that's your best flavor. And when I go to conventions and everything, the coffee snobs laugh at my athletic. I was like, D did you really mix a Robusta with it? Yes, I did. And guess what? I sell the Freaking fuck delicious. out of it. It's so, so good through all of you guys. And I'm a subscriber and you guys should be too. Folks, Anna Vicino has some uh, sauces out there and you need to go get them all. Go get yourself some, um, go to eathappykitchen.com. That's what it's called, eathappykitchen.com. Go there, get it, use it. You're going to love it. Um, I still have one of the uh, pumpkin ones left and I don't know what I'm going to do with it. You're the only one in the US. I, I had to send mine, we, some, somebody's package broke. And I, uh, I had one twin pack left and I had to send it <laughs> to the customer. So I didn't you know get what? it. I should do mine the highest bidder and I'll sign it and oh, send it to you. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Yeah. The highest bidder. I, can or I read? Or just keep yeah. it, eat it. Cause it's really yummy. <laughs> yeah, screw it. If you guys gave me 500 bucks, it's not worth it. <laughs> stuff. So um, go check out Eat Happy Kitchen and the There's cookbook. There's still three delicious flavors left. Yeah, the, the, and a, and a, a, Oscar, a, the marinara and the crema. Yeah, you get them. Um, also, folks, uh, go get the books. Eat Happy Kitchen. I mean, Eat Happy Cookbook and Eat Happy Cookbook 2. T-O-O. -O. Go check those out. Anna will sign one for you. If you whether they have to write to you, Anna, to get the signed copy. DM me. I'm not hard to find. DM me or email me on my site or whatever. DM me on, on the Instagram is probably the best way. She and, will send you a signed copy. Uh, signed copy, 25 bucks. If you want me to sign I'll it, it, I'll take good it. Luck. I'm not doing it. <laughs> He's not doing it, folks. Nope. Not signing anything. I'm not signing. giving out his address. Nope. Not doing it. Um, too many people looking for me now. And when the new movie comes out, oh boy. I'm going to have to add to my gun arsenal around here. And oh, maybe, boy. Maybe even get myself some guard dogs because it ain't going to be pretty around here because I don't know if Bonzo is guarding the house just enough. And as you know, everything reminds me of a song around here. So I'm going to yeah. turn off the um, okay. 